Hello, Vision Chasers. I've got a uh, primary source here that I want to share with you. Uh, a few a couple months ago, I did a lesson about uh, President Truman and his desegregation of the military. And one of the things that really prompted him to consider desegregating the military was the story of Isaac Woodard. Isaac Woodard fought bravely for the United States, his country, in World War II in the Pacific. And unfortunately and so sadly, when he came home, he had to continue to deal with the realities of oppression, segregation, and discrimination in his homeland. And an unfortunate and unjust incident with the police left him blind for the rest of his life. And there were not many people who would speak up for, uh, for justice on his behalf. But there was one person who would speak up on his behalf. And as you can see on his screen, Orson Welles was a white man and he was a very, he was a very popular entertainer. And Orson Welles, as you're going to hear shortly, he goes on the radio and he actually calls out the police officer and he demands justice for Isaac Woodard as he reads a shortened account of what led Isaac Woodard to become blind while in the custody of the police. And so with that being said, I present to you Orson Welles demanding justice on behalf of Isaac Woodard. Good morning, this is Orson Welles speaking. I'd like to read to you an affidavit. I, Isaac Woodward Jr., being duly sworn to depose and state as follows, that I am 27 years old and a veteran of the United States Army, having served for 15 months in the South Pacific and earned one battle star. I was honorably discharged on February 12, 1946, from Camp Gordon, Georgia, at 8.30 p.m. at the Greyhound Terminal, Atlanta, Georgia. While I was in uniform, I purchased a ticket to Winsboro, South Carolina, and took the bus headed there to pick up my wife to come to New York to see my father and mother. About one hour out of Atlanta, the bus driver stopped at a small drugstore. As he stopped, I asked him if he had time to wait for me until I had a chance to go to the restroom. He cursed and said no. When he cursed me, I cursed him back. When the bus got to Aiken, he got off and went and got the police. They didn't give me a chance to explain. The policeman struck me with a billy across my head and told me to shut up. After that, the policeman grabbed me by my left arm and twisted it behind my back. I figured he was trying to make me resist. I did not resist against him. He asked me, was I discharged? And I told him yes. When I said yes, that is when he started beating me with a billy, hitting me across the top of the head. After that, I grabbed his billy and wrung it out of his hand. Another policeman came up and threw his gun on me and told me to drop the billy, and he dropped me, so... I dropped the billy. After I dropped the billy, the second policeman held his gun on me while the other one was beating me. He knocked me unconscious. After I commenced to come to myself, he all would get up. I started to get up. He started punching me in my eyes with the end of the billy. When I finally got up, he pushed me inside the jailhouse and locked me up. I woke up next morning and could not see. A policeman said, let's go up here and see what the judge says. I told him that I could not see how to come out. I was blind. He said, feel your way out. He said, I'd be all right after I washed my face. He led me to the judge, and after I told the judge what happened, he said, we don't have that kind of stuff down here. Then the policeman said, he wrung my billy out of my hand, and I told him if he didn't drop it, I'd drop him. That's how I knew it was the same policeman as had beat my eyes out. After that, the judge spoke and said, I fine you $50 for 30 days in the road, and I said I'd pay the $50, but I did not have the $50 at the time. So the policeman said, you have some money there in your wallet. He took my wallet and took out all I had, and... That was a total of $40 and took $4 from my watch pocket. I had a check for $694.73, which was my mustering out pay and soldier's deposit. said to me, can you see how to sign this check? You have a government check. I told him, no, sir. So he gave it back to me after that. He took me back and locked me up in the jail. The policeman did. I stayed in there for a while, and after a few minutes, he came and asked me if I wanted a drink of whiskey. I, if I took a drink of whiskey, he said I'd feel better. I told him, no, sir. Didn't care for any. About 5.30 that evening, they took me to the Veterans Hospital in Columbia, South Carolina. One of the contact men came around one day and said to me they were going to take out a pension for me. I believe that the doctor who cared for me was named Dr. Clarence. I told him what had happened to me. He made no comment, but told me I should join a blind school. Sworn to me, this is the 23rd day of April, 1946. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I had that affidavit in my pocket a few hours before dawn. When I left off worrying about this broadcast long enough for coffee at an all-night restaurant, I found myself joined at the table by a stranger. A nice, soft-spoken, well-meaning, well-mannered stranger he was. He told me a joke. He thinks it's a joke. 
I'm going to repeat it, but not for your amusement. I earnestly hope that nobody listening will laugh. This is the joke. It seems there was a white man who came on business to a southern town. It could be Aiken, South Carolina, and found he couldn't get a bed in any of the good hotels. He went to the bad hotels and finally the flop houses, but there was no room for him in any of the inns reserved for white hope folks in that southern city. So at last, in desperation, he applied at a Negro hotel where he was accepted with the proviso that he would consent to share a double room with another guest. With rueful gratitude, this white man paid his bill, left a call for early in the morning. He rested well, quite undisturbed by the proximity of the sleeping colored man beside him and was awakened at the hour of his request. After breakfast, he left the railway station where he boarded his appointed train, but the conductor would not let him into any of the regular coaches. The man was told quite rudely to go where he belonged, the Jim Crow car. The hero of this funny story allowed he hadn't washed in the morning that the dust of travel must be responsible for the conductor's grievous social miscalculation. He went to the washroom. He started to clean his hands. They were black, an even hue of black. Then he looked into the mirror. His face was the same color. He not only looked darker than white, he was quite visibly a Negro. A great oath precedes the final line, which is presumed to be the funny part of this little anecdote. I know what's happened to the next words of the man. It's very simple. They woke up the wrong man. I left the teller of this tale in the coffee shop, but I found I couldn't leave the tale itself. Like the affidavit I read to you at the start of the broadcast, it seems to become a permanent part of my mental luggage. I sketched in my imagination a sequel to the stranger's funny joke. I saw the man of business who'd gone to bed, a white man getting into an argument with the conductor. I saw a policeman boarding the train at the next station and taking the man of business out on the platform and beating the eyes out of his head because the man thought he should be treated with the same respect he had received the day before when he was white. I saw men at the police station trying to make him take a drink so that the medical authorities could testify that he was drunk. I saw the man of business bleeding in his cell, reaching out with sightless hands through unseen bars, gesturing for help that would not, could not ever come. And I heard his explanation echoing down the stone hallways of the jail. I know what's happened. It's very simple. They woke up the wrong man. Now, it seems the officer of the law who blinded the young Negro boy of the affidavit has not been named. The boy saw him while he could still see, but of course he had no way of knowing what particular policeman it was who brought the justice of Dasha and Osvikim to Aiken, South Carolina. He was just another white man with a stick who wanted to teach a Negro boy a lesson to show a Negro boy where he belonged in the darkness. Till we know more about him, for just now we'll call the policeman Officer X. He might be listening to this. I hope so. Officer X, I'm talking to you. Officer X, they woke up the wrong man. That somebody else, that man sleeping there, is you. The you that... God brought into the world, all innocent of hate, a paid-up resident member of the Brotherhood of Man. Yes, unbelievably enough, that's you, Officer X. You, still asleep. That you could have been anything. It could have gone to the White House when it grew up. It could have gone to heaven when it died. But they woke up the wrong man. They finally came for him in the blank gray of dawn, as in the death house they come for the condemned, but without prayers. They came with instructions, the accumulated ignorance of the feudal South. And with this peculiar briefing, they called Cain for another day of the devil's work while Abel slept. Wash your hands, Officer X. Wash them well. Scrub and scour. You won't blot out the blood of a blinded war veteran. Nor yet the color of your skin, your own skin. You'll never, never, never change it. Wash your hands, Officer X. Wash a lifetime, you'll never wash away that leprous lack of pigment, the guilty pallor of the white man. We invite you to luxuriate in secrecy. It will be brief. Go on, suckle your anonymous moment while it lasts. You're going to be uncovered. We will blast out your name. We'll give the world your given name, Officer X. Yes, and your so-called Christian name. It's going to rise out of the filthy deep like the dead thing it is. We're going to make it public with a public scandal you dictated but failed to sign. We pause now for a word from the philosophers. A short reminder regarding the matter of payment and cost. Nothing is paid back. That does not happen, not on earth. A favor cannot be paid back, neither can a wrong. 
We say a criminal pays for his crime when we lock him up. The murderer pays for his murder when the state murders him. But really, the state is hiding an unsightly object. Society is merely sweeping its dirt under the carpet. We may sometimes manage to cure the thing called crime... But the man called a criminal is never punished. He can be inconvenienced or tormented or done away with, but he cannot pay for what he has done. If the ledger is ever balanced, it is not by him, but by some other man having nothing to do with him. It is balanced by deeds of virtue, by unrelated good works. The evildoer's agony doesn't show on the books. Only that fiction known to us as money can be paid back. The true debt, the debt of a friend to a friend or a foe to a foe, outlives the principles involved. So much for payment. Price. That's something else. There's a price for everything. There's nothing that does not have its cost. Joy and inspiration and mere pleasure have a market value precisely computed in terms of their opposites. The cost of youth is age. The cost of age is death. You want love? The cost of love is independence. You want to be independent, do you? Then pay the price and know what it is to be alone. Your mother paid for you with pain. Nothing, nothing in this living world is free. The free air costs you the life-consuming effort of breath. Freedom itself is priced at the rate of the citizenship it earns and holds. What does it cost to be a Negro? In Aiken, South Carolina, it costs a man his eyes. What does it cost to wear over your skeleton the pinkish tint officially described as white? In Aiken, South Carolina, it costs a man his soul. Officer X may languish in jail. It's unlikely, but it's possible that he'll serve as long a term as a Negro would serve in Aiken, South Carolina, for stealing bread. But Officer X will never pay for the two eyes he beat out of the soldier's head. How can you essay the gift of sight? What are they quoting today for one eye? An eye for an eye? A literal reading of this mosaic law spells out again only the blank waste of vengeance. We've told Officer X that he will be dragged out of hiding... We've promised him a most unflattering glare of publicity. We're going to keep that promise. We will build our own police lineup to line up this reticent policeman with the killers, the lunatics, the beast men, all the people of society's zoo where he belongs. If he's listening to this, let him listen well. Officer X, after I've found you out, I'll never lose you. If they try you, I'm going to watch the trial. If they jail you, I'm going to wait for your first day of freedom. You won't be free of me. I want to see who's waiting for you at the prison gates. I want to know who will acknowledge that they know you. I'm interested in your future. I will take careful note of all your destinations. Assume another name and I will be careful that the name you would forget is not forgotten. I will find means to remove from you all refuge, Officer X. You can't get rid of me. We have an appointment, you and I, and only death can cancel it. Who am I? A masked avenger from the comic books? No, sir. Merely an inquisitive citizen of America. I admit that nothing on this inhabited earth is capable of your chastisement. I'm simply but quite actively curious to know what will become of you. Your fate cannot affect the boy in the country hospital for the blind, but your welfare is a measure of the welfare of my country. I cannot call it your country. How long will you get along in these United States? Which of the states will still consent to get along with you? Where stands the sun of common fellowship? When will it rise over your dark country? When will it be noon in Georgia? I must know where you go, Officer X, because I must know where the rest of us are going with our American experiment. Into bankruptcy or into that serene tomorrow, that plenteous garden the blind soldier hoped for when he had his eyes and with eyes opened went to war. We want a word to lighten his darkness. You're sorry for him? He rejects your pity. You're ashamed? He doesn't care. We want to tell him soon that all America is ashamed of you. If there's room for pity, you can have it, for you're far more blind than he. He had eyes to see and saw with them, made out, if nothing else, at least a part of the shape of human dignity. And this is not a little thing, but you had eyes to see and you have never seen. He has the memory of light, but you were born in the pit. He cannot grow new eyes to open the world again for his poor bruised head. Never. No. The only word we can share the martyr with to carry him from the county hospital to the county grave is word concerning your eyes, Officer X. Your eyes, remember, were not gouged away. Only the lids are closed. You might raise the lids. You might just try the wild adventure of looking. You might see something. It might be a simple truth. One of those truths held to be self-evident by our founding fathers and by most of us. If we should ever find you bravely blinking at the sun, we'll know then that the world is young after all. That chaos is behind us and not ahead. Then there will be shouting of trumpets to rouse the dead at Gettysburg. 
A thunder of cannon will declare the tidings of peace, and all the bells of liberty will laugh out loud in the streets to celebrate goodwill towards all men. The new blind can hear it be very good if they could hear the news that the old blind can finally see then. Officer X, you'll find that you can wash off what should be washed, and it will be said of you, yes, even you, that they awakened the right man. Now it's time to say goodbye. Please let me come to call again. Next week, same time. Until then, I remain as always obediently yours. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company invites you to be with us again next Sunday afternoon at 1.15 o'clock over most of these very same stations when we shall again hear from Mr. Orson Welles. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.